Let us now look into differentials. This is the second ingredient that we will need for the Riemann-Roch theorem. Now we will uh, define what the space of differential forms is. So the space of rational differential forms, omega c, on the uh, projective reducible curve c, that is the kc vector space generated by symbols, df, so abstract symbols, but subject to the following relations. First, df plus g is df plus dg. Second, we have a form of a Leibniz rule, dfg is fdg plus gdf, and da is zero for all constants a. Indeed, this can be defined in a much greater generality than for projective curves. So for example, I can define exactly the same game for a fine space. So let's see what that gives me. So then the, co the um, coordinate ring of affine space is, the, so the ring of regular functions, this is just the polynomial ring. So I need to define, like, to begin with, uh, what df is for a regular function f. So if I take a regular function f, well, such a function is a polynomial, but since df plus g is determined by df and dg, I can start with monomials. And since d of the product uh, is in the span of the factors, really this will boil down to df for f, a linear polynomial. Namely because, for example, um, if I take a general monomial dTi to the power d, then this is Ti to the power d minus 1 dTi plus Ti to the power dTi d minus 1. And so this, using this inductively, for example, I get that dTi squared is 2Ti dTi. And in general, df will be, as perhaps expected, the sum over all i of df dTi dTi. So this is indeed related to the uh, tangent spaces, or rather the cotangent spaces, that we have calculated. Um, and in principle, what one does with these rational functions is that one, one knows how to compute them for affine space and therefore for affine varieties and then patching together, uh, one gets some definition, local definition uh, on any variety uh, of a more general kind. And now I did this for polynomials, but by using quotients, I, you can define this for rational functions. General. But we will not so much look into the general structure of these differential forms, we will stay with our curve. And the claim is that the vector space omega c for a curve c, and now henceforth I will be assuming that c is also smooth, then omega c is one dimensional and it is spanned by dt where t is the uniformizer at any point p. So what does this uniformizer mean? So at P, the local ring is a discrete valuation ring. So this has a maximal ideal. The ideal IP is principal. And a uniformizer is any generator of the principal ideal in a discrete valuation ring, any generator of the maximal ideal in a discrete valuation. And uh, let's look at an example, perhaps. So if, for example, I take as C the projective line and I take a point uh, P, say, equal to zero with respect to some parameter T, 
by this I mean I take t as my parameter, so that is um, the coordinate, and I choose my point so that at this coordinate this is t. So then uh, t is the is a uniformizer of the ideal at zero, the, the local maximal ideal, and any function will satisfy that df is df dt dt by the same game as we did for the affine space. And in general, the coordinate of any element of omega c will be denoted by omega dt. So this means that since this is a one-dimensional space, I have a coordinate representation of this shape. And so this is a function. So now I'm looking at uh, a vector space over the space of func or over the field of rational functions. So what properties do these differential forms have? If I take a point in my smooth curve and the maximal ideal at this point, the local maximal ideal I say is generated by t, then the following holds. So first, if f is a regular function at p, so f doesn't have a pole at p, then neither does this df dt. So remember, f df is df dt dt, and so this function will not have a pole either. This is perhaps easy to believe. I will omit the proof and rely on some elementary intuition. Next, if I take um, any omega, and this should not be in Kc, it should be in omega c, the order is independent of the choice of t, and so we denote this the order of omega. So what does this mean? Well, this IP, I can choose a different generator, S, for the ideal IP. And then I need to show that it doesn't um, differ. The order doesn't depend on T or S. So uh, if I take omega, then omega is omega ds ds. And because ds is ds dt dt, I have this. And by uniqueness of the coordinate representation, this has to be omega dt. And so the order at p of omega dt is the order of this product. And because the order is a discrete valuation, this is the order of omega ds plus the order of ds dt. So I need to show that this is zero. And the reason this is zero is because both s and t are regular at p. They're certainly not divided by uh, t or s, so to speak. So this implies that both ds dt and dt ds are regular. And since they are inverses to each other, by the uniqueness of the presentation here, if I take omega equals um, dt, I get dt ds ds dt, t, so this has to be 1, their product is 1, and both are regular, so their uh, order is non-negative. Because of this, their order is also non-positive, so it has to be 0. And so this means that the order of omega doesn't depend on the choice of uniformizer. It really just depends on omega and p. And therefore, I can define the, div uh, the divisor associated to omega in exactly the same way as I did for rational functions. And uh, doing so, I uh, get something that is well defined, and this will also only uh, be non-zero at a finite number of points, for similar reasons as before. One point is that the divisors of omega and omega prime, they are linearly equivalent, meaning that omega and omega prime, through their divisors, 
define one and the same class in the Picard group, in the divisor class group. Yeah, why is that? Well, since they are both non-zero, you can pause and think why that is. So I can take omega as the basis of my one-dimensional space of um, differential forms, and then omega prime will be some f of f times omega. So the divisor of omega prime will be the divisor of f of omega. But the order of f omega is the order of f plus the order of omega by choosing a uniformizer and writing omega in this fashion then you will get this from the definition of a discrete valuation so this will be the divisor of f plus the divisor of omega by definition of the group structure and the abelian group of divisors and so this precisely means that these two divisors differ by a principal divisor and so therefore they are linearly equivalent. So they define a unique class that we will therefore call the canonical divisor class. And any divisor in this class will be called a canonical divisor. And now we finally have all the tools we need to state the Riemann-Roch theorem. If C now is an irreducible smooth projective curve and KC a canonical divisor on C, then the Riemann-Roch theorem states that there exists an integer g such that for any divisor d, l of d minus l of kc minus d is equal to the degree of d minus this integer plus 1. So let us stop to think what this gives us. So l of d, this was the thing that we wanted to know. This is the dimension of the space of all um, rational functions whose poles are controlled by d. So this is what we are interested in knowing. This term should be seen as some sort of correction term. So really we want to say that ld is equal to this stuff, but we cannot, this is uh, what we need to add. The degree of d is the sum of the coefficients of the divisor d. So that is some uh, information that is readily, readily available. Um, and g is this integer that exists that we will be able to calculate in a moment. Historically, Riemann himself proved that L of d is at least this right-hand side in the setting where he was working. And Roch's contribution, Roch, who was a student of Riemann's, contributed this correction term. And the integer g is called the genus of c. And this is how we define the genus in this algebra geometric setting. So let us look at a few consequences of this. First, g is equal to L of kc. The rest of the statement, let's prove this part assuming the theorem. So in the theorem, we just postulated the existence of g. And so if I now apply the theorem, to the divisor that is zero, the neutral element of the divisor group, then I get L of zero minus L of kc equals to the degree of zero minus g plus one. But the degree of zero is zero by definition. The dimension of the space of a regular of divisors of uh, so dimension of space of regular functions which this is these are just the constant functions so this is one and so puzzling this together I get that g is equal to l of kc and one interpretation is that this is the dimension of the space of everywhere regular differentiable differential forms why is that well l of kc this is the dimension of the vector space of all f such that div f is greater than or equal to minus div omega for some differential form omega. 
So by moving omega to the other side and using the fact that div is a homomorphism or that div relies on ord p, which is a homomorphism, we get this thing. So these are precisely those differential forms. Finally, the degree of kc is equal to 2g minus 2. So now we know the degree of this canonical divisor. And I will let you prove this by setting d equals kc this time and applying the riemann roch theorem. So uh, hopefully this has given you an idea of the ingredients that go into the riemann roch theorem that are interesting each and every one of them on their own right and of what the theorem says. Hopefully when we acquire tools from sheaf theory we will be able to revisit this theorem and take a more conceptual and deeper look at it. But for now, this is enough.